So um, this is the November 21st meeting of the Conway Select Board. Um, first item on the agenda is approving the minutes of November 8th. Anybody have any issues with they the minutes? They look good to me. Okay. Um, next item is the warrants. Well, hold on. I make a motion that we accept the minutes. Oh, yeah, right. Sorry. Oh, my gosh. That second. Yeah, I'm, I'm That's screaming. okay. We all say aye. Yeah, good. I do too. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Unanimous. The warrants, um, we have an accounts payable, 2212 of $103,043.32. A payroll warrant of $108,864.82. Payroll deduction warrant for $27,789.41. And um, I, I have not seen these. I know that Michael was working remotely today. So these were in digital format and I have not had a chance to look at these. I know so that people can pay our usual practices to vote on something like this. And then we can have in our individual questions resolved to our satisfaction. Um, so with that, we need a motion to approve these three warrants. I'll make the motion. And, and well, I'll sec uh, you'll second it. Second. Or All whatever. Favor. I'll second it. Aye. I vote aye. All right. All right. Aye. Unanimous. Meetings attended by select board members. Erica. Um, none since our last meeting. Man. Um, Bob. Oh, well, I've had uh, meetings with the Conservation Commission. And, and, and I can tell you that the only interesting, we've had a bunch of Conservation Commission meetings, but, but the interesting one has to do with a big solar, uh, no, a, a fairly large residential size solar development up on Roaring Brook Road, right next to, right next to uh, Roy's property, which Roy's not on the call yet, but he may be late, oh no, maybe not today. But, and we're having a hard time because we can't seem to get in touch with the solar developer. So we've scheduled a number of site visits and there was some discussion and I'm not sure it hasn't been talked about in select board meetings, but, but uh, why the solar is designed the way it is and it seems unusual or else maybe we're not reading the plans correctly. And, and, the, and the other question has to do with to what extent the Conservation Commission should be looking out for things that might normally be the, the purview of the planning board, like you know, like, is this solar project so large that it really should be going before the planning board? And, and who is it that looks at that? And, you know, and I'm not sure that it's the Conservation Commission's business, but we do tend to, we're nosy or whatever, we do tend to look at things like that. And, um, uh, uh, you know, so the planning board is, asks us questions when we go there to look at it, to try to give them some answers. And, and uh, so I just don't really, and, and you know, and, and Kimberly, I don't think that you would know, but it's sort of like a fur cog um, thing, you know, with, with the, uh, the, the uh, what is it? You provide the service for us to do the, the uh, inspection, you know, the building inspection. And, and do they know all of Conway's rules? And, you know, do they have to know those rules for all of the towns that they service? And, or, or are those, Somehow should Conway be doing that ourselves, but. Um. Well, I, so if the building inspector is the zoning enforcement officer, he sh will, should be aware of each town's zoning regulations. So if there's a question about whether or not the project is in compliance with the town zoning bylaw, I would encourage you to have a conversation with the building inspector. So, you know, in general, we have, as the Conservation Commission, we talk with the planning board or, you know, our friends here in Conway. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it just, you know, is something that we need to resolve. But, but it, it, you know, it, it, because it involves, because we have a number of committees within Conway all talking about it, it felt like a good thing for me to mention at, at this, at the meeting tonight. Uh, and uh, so anyway, and, and we've, we're still, we're still reviewing the, the, uh, 
Comcast franchise agreement, we're right, and we should be very close, but uh, so that's it for me. Well, um, I unfortunately had many meetings. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll start, start with Conway Grammar School. So there was initial uh, discussions of the capital budget and the operating budget. Um, we are unfortunately this year going to be paying for six teachers retirements. Um, two from last year and four from this year, and uh, which is a number in excess of $100,000 because of our very generous long-term uh, or sick pay buyback at, upon retirement. Um, and what that means is that in, even if there were no other expenses, uh, if, if every other expense stayed level, that would already, that would, just that those retirements put us into a double-digit percentage increase for the grammar school. And we're negotiating with the unions now. And it's to start out with this background knowledge that your budget is already blown up and, you know, whatever, you know, I'll do my best. Like we're doing our, I'm doing my best um, to keep the, keep it this first year, especially low. Um, but it seems a shame they can't be to spread out over five years or something. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the, the last year's big, but last budget, last negotiating cycle's big win for the town. And it was the thing that I was all about was we reformed that sick pay buyback, at least for new hires. Right. You know, but, but that's still, that's 18 more years that it's still on the books. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, you know, but, but at least our grandchildren, or at least our grandchildren won't have to deal with it. Um, but so, you know. The, the, um, uh, is this the most retirements we've ever had? Yeah, probably, probably seems it. And, yeah. and, and they're all from teachers that love their job and never took sick days, you know, of course, you know, um, so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, um, there's also a cap, there's going to be capital requests as well. There was an initial thing about that, but that's a whole separate thing. So, um, I uh, went to the initial meeting of the formation of the Economic Development Committee, um, which seems off to a rousing start. Went to the initial meeting of the ARPA uh, funds, advisory funds, what to spend it on committee meeting. Um, and uh, yeah, multiple, multiple teacher negotiation, IA negotiation, strategy sessions, and is not fair, um, but you know that's the world we live in, and got it, got it, got it, got it. Just the changes that are, we are capable of doing are baby steps every three years. That's just the way it is. So, um, yeah. With that, public comment. Do we have any uh, public making a public mm -hmm. comment? Uh, can you guys hear me? This is George Forster calling. Yes, George uh, Forster. I had to dial in with my phone because my uh, I'm having desktop issues tonight. Okay. Um, so you're not going to see me, but I guess you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Uh, Veronique suggested I jump in on the public comments tonight to try to get a, a ball rolling. Good. Um, as you guys know, you appointed me to be an alternate non-voting member of the Historic Commission to help it facilitate the McLeese Stonehouse donation project. Yeah, seems like um, a natural thing to do. Yeah, um, but in the meantime, uh, I've been notified by the Ethics Commission, the State Ethics Commission, that because I'm in a butter to the land in question, um, that it's a technical de facto conflict. Oh. Um, however, the the fix there's a fix and the fix is because it's an appointed position the fix is the 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 board of select the the, the select board uh simply needs to sign off on a disclosure form that says um you know i, I disclose that i'm in the butter and you essentially say that's fine with us and and then i could go forward if that's what you so choose but they say technically there's 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 a, a violation of the uh, uh, conflict of interest law, even and as a non-voting member. Apparently, it <laughs> didn't seem to make any uh, difference with him because he says I'm still working on the project. 
you know, so somehow I could subtly influence um, the outcome. Because I thought, gee, I don't, I, I don't even vote on the commission, and the commission doesn't even vote on the ultimate decision uh, to accept the property or not. And so I, I felt I was two or three steps removed, but but the uh, the commission lawyer said the uh, the ethics lawyer said that 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 doesn't matter because it's because I'm in a butter. It's sort of like a de facto conflict. Um, it trumps other things. So, but it's an easy fix. He said, if you so choose to uh, simply, um, you know, sign this waiver essentially that says it's okay. Um, because yeah, it's the, an appointed position, not an elected the, one. The, is there a form that they gave you or anything like that? Or is there any? Yes, there's, there's a form that I've already accessed and I filled out my part, which sort of explains what the presumed right. conflict is. And um, I can print that out and make it available to you guys, however you want to do that um, and however you want to deliberate and so forth. But I just thought I would, I would jump in tonight and raise the question because I'm trying to keep these balls moving forward and, and I'm just trying to avoid you know, unnecessary so, delays. So, George, like, I mean, the this this wasn't on the agenda. So, I mean, normally we wouldn't be able to deliberate tonight because that would be violating the open meeting law. We would have to put it on yeah. the agenda for, for next time. Is this time sense, whatever, can it wait two weeks? Well, whatever you guys need to do, it's just, I'm, yeah. I'll be in limbo until then, that's all. So, the, you know, whatever you can do as soon as you can is great. No, I would hope that Veronique can ver see whether or not we can sign it or not. Maybe, I, I mean, we are talking about it in this meeting, but it wasn't on the agenda, but I'm not sure if it requires it. You know, should we make sure that George's neighbors have an opportunity to come in and argue that we shouldn't sign it? I mean, that would, you know, you know I mean, I, I, right. Uh, I know. Yeah, I, I, like, I don't know. I, I can't really respond to that without feeling like I'm crossing over the line, though. Like, but, um, <laughs> you know, that. Um, I, I do. I, I will say just as an observation, we have signed similar things in the past. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. And this and, ethics and, lawyer, for what it's worth, you know, he seemed pretty straightforward about it. He said, all you have to do is just, you know, this is an easy fix. You just have to do this. He didn't make it sound like it was um, a scary proposition in any way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we best we best do it proper and put it on the agenda. And if the neighbors want to, if the neighbors want to voice their opinion, then they can, you know. So did you hear all that, Journey? You good? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I've been trying to say the reason that I asked George to come in at the public comments was to give you a heads up ahead of time. I agreed yeah. this should not be voted on tonight. This should be at the next meeting. Um, but I thought this way, at least you'd have the heads up of what was going to happen. And maybe it could be very quick next, next meeting. Yeah. Good. Good. And then, yeah. And so, so there you I, are. Heads up. And, and I, what I can do in the meantime um, is fill out my portion of this form and then get it to Veronique so that she can facilitate its signing at the appropriate time. Great. And then, you know, I, and I guess, you know, George, if, if, if any one of us three has any questions or any reason to, you know, next in, in two weeks to discuss this with you further, then we can ask Veronique to let you know and have you appear. But sure. other than that, other than that, um, you're not given a call to appear then i just you don't have to all right all right so if i don't hear from you again i'll just assume you know what you need to know and, and yeah. you'll act on it however you're going to do that exactly um okay all right weeks. well thanks for letting me jump in um and i hope next time i'll have the appropriate hardware so you can see my smiling face ah <laughs> uh, cool great thanks george Can't wait thanks all right all right take see care bye-bye All right, old business, there's none. New business, new business. Special guest, Rosalie Starvish, project manager and water resources engineer from GZA Geo Environmental Inc. And Kimberly Noke McPhee, the land use and natural resources planning program manager with FERCOG, here to discuss the municipal vulnerability program grant scope of work and contracts. I was reading from that. That wasn't, in, that wasn't. I was very impressed. <laughs> uh, oh, good, 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 good. 
So, you know. <laughs> so we, we sent um, the draft contracts to the town for review and we're just here tonight to answer any questions that you might have about the contract scope of work um, and yeah. So the COG is the contract with the Franklin Regional Council of Governments is for the public outreach and education tasks. And it includes continuing to work with the planning board on um, river corridor management strategies, including um, the river corridor protection overlay district. It includes convening another resilient rivers community open house. And I would work closely with the planning board to schedule that in February, and they had been planning to do something similar before the town received this grant award. So that's really good. Uh, we would also be doing updates to the story map that was created as part of the last MVP funded project. We will also be writing some articles for the Conway current and basically just supporting the town and their consultant team um, to help engage residents in the project. There's also some work to be done to continue the outreach to um, landowners who might be have property and interest in flood resiliency projects that could be identified for Conway Center as part of the modeling that Rosalie and her team will do and she can speak more to that. So yeah, we're excited to continue the work um, on this project. And like I said, if you have any questions about the, the scope of work or the contracts, we'd be happy to answer them. And Rosalie, I don't know if you want to give a quick summary of what your scope of work is. That's what I was hoping for. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, GCA is our, our contract has two primary tasks. Um, one is the um, Conway Center flood modeling and resilience analysis. Um, when we worked on the um, Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership MVP funded project. We did some modeling of the South River and it showed that there was, um, you know, concerning amount of flooding potentially in Conway Center. Um, so what we want to do is um, expand that model to include Pumpkin Hollow Brook it was a tributary. Um, we you know, we modeled the flow from Pumpkin Hollow Brook, but we didn't actually model the, the water levels in Pumpkin Hollow Brook. Um, and we also want to, um, you know, take a more detailed look at the sources of flooding through Conway Center and then use the model to evaluate some potential um, resilience projects. Um, and then the other task is the... Um, permit applications for the culvert replacement project um, of Main Poland Road over Johnny Bean Brook. Um, we had prepared the design of that culvert replacement in the prior grant project. And um, the next step for that would be to um, file the permit applications um, so that hopefully we can get another grant to go to construction. Um, and then we're also have a little bit of budget for us to support for COG with the public outreach pro process that Kimberly just described. Um, uh, any other questions? I, I have a question. Sure. Um, uh, as you know, as you know, or certainly Kimberly knows and that uh, you know, we love these projects when they finally 
succeed. Um, and they have a lot of costs with them, overhead and so forth, and permitting costs. And I've inquired to, to Kimberly about this not too long ago to try to just get some background research. And it occurred to me that, that some of the expensive permitting costs, this is the question, they're due like when you as the engineering firm apply to the state, mass, uh, natural heritage, et cetera, et cetera, for these permits. Um, my hunch is that they're quite expensive. When uh, the town applies, and I have done a few small ones for the town for wetlands work, uh, then the town is, is, doesn't have to pay the permits. And I just wondered if we could just take a, a, a couple of minutes to, to respond to that, Kimberly or Rosalie? Um, so I think, I, I'm sorry I missed the first part. Oh. Talking right now. It's okay. okay. I will talk up now. Okay, go ask Mitchell. Um, I have my nine-year-old babysitting my four-year-old. Oh, yeah. um, That's even better I, than a puppy jumping up on your lap. <laughs> um, so the... The applicant would still be the town. So there are fees associated with permit these various permits, but usually most cases, the municipal, you know, municipalities don't have to pay the fee. Um, and even though we're preparing the applications, the applicant would still be the town. So it still goes in under the town's name and, and has the has the section where there's mostly like no fees for that, that you're exempt right. on an NOI. Yes. On the notice of intent, you're exempt. Okay. Yes. Well, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think um, the way I heard your question, Janet, was that the permitting costs for these projects are high. And the answer to that is, is yes, the simple answer is yes. And it's not the application fees, it's the actual uh, time that it takes for the engineers and the river scientists to prepare the applications with all the supporting documentation and then the back and forth that happens with the regulatory agencies. And Rosalie can speak more to that point uh, but I'll just say quickly that, for example, with the South River Meadow project, we had to go back and forth with natural heritage um, and DEP because of the wood turtles and the long nose sucker, uh, two species of concern under the Massachusetts Endangered Species Act. So we live Franklin County is blessed with all of these natural resources. And what happens when you go through the regulatory process is that the agency staff are paying particular attention to what is happening because they, uh, by statute, have to do so. And because a lot of this work that we are doing is um, kind of at the leading edge of river and climate resiliency work in Massachusetts, there's kind of this, you know, learning curve that the state agencies are, are going through. Um, I've been advocating for years. This is something that if you talk to your state uh, reps about this, you know, it's something to bring up. Massachusetts needs to think about having design standards for these projects, right? Floodplain reconnection projects are not, um, they're what we need to do, not only in Conway, but in other areas of the state. And if the stumbling block is going to be the state's own regulatory framework, that's pretty ridiculous. But um, yeah, the costs are not the application fees. The costs come with the consultants having to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with the regulatory agency. Okay, I mean, okay, that, that helps, that answers a lot. It's just that 
time. And uh, <laughs> Rosalie, um, I don't know if you want to add to that with based on your. Yeah, I would add too that sometimes with the um, that that back and forth, there's sometimes changes that need to be made to the design drawings, which adds an engineering cost to the overall uh, permitting process. Uh, okay, good. That answers the question. I mean, I think we're still private. Some of us as, you know, private citizens are still going to work on a strategy to, to, um, you know, address the, pull it, the regulations through, uh, through uh, other channels. But in order to do that, I, you know, we have to have like specifics and like where and what. And so we know better what we're talking about, you know, when we just present something to our state legislature. I think this is a problem generally, you know, um, you know, they, well, what should I do about it? Well, you know, that's, that's. Uh, it is uh, a problem. So, we have, so, so therefore I have to get a little bit into the nitty gritty, you know, yeah. to, so I wrote a note to myself, Janet. I did see your email come through. Uh -huh. I, wrote, okay. I, wrote, I wrote a note yeah. to myself to follow up on that um, as quickly as I can. And, and also just kind of as an aside, we, you know, we see similar problems with the, um, the culvert replacement projects because they have to meet the mass stream crossing standards. And that generally, you know, drives up the cost as well. The state did have a blue ribbon panel that they convened. Um, I think maybe the report came out right before the COVID lockdown that identified some ways to kind of streamline that process and reduce the cost. So I think it's great if you're going to be advocating yeah. about this, yeah. Janet, because this is kind of the right, next right. frontier. I mean, you know, the bigger picture is absolutely. I mean, I support yeah. the wood turtles and Conway is very proud that we still have some home to some of these these animals that are symbolic of our of our river and environment. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, you know, we just need to be as effective as possible. And I hate to, you know, you guys work a long time to come up with the best plans. And then to have the state basically sounds like starts tinkering them down and tinkering them down, costing us a lot more, more, right? And not getting as effective end product in terms of the restoration we want. So, uh, so that's um, good. Uh, I, I'm not sure anybody else was here. We had a, a Zoom call earlier meeting that, that Kimberly arranged on sort of the on, start of this new project and there were two higher ups uh in the that you you had with us Kimberly from the something or other department unit you know that fellow and your friend your whatever your colleague do you remember who I'm talking about I and mean, we had a little bit of this discussion and they said very clearly that you know they're basically just these are the regulations we have to follow and it's not up to us you know these overseers implementers to do anything else they can i mean that's that's what they said so and, and right. janet so the select board no it's it's we've well, got to go other angles janet i was on that call with you and, and yes you know and and i and i remember asking the um yes the, the uh D, the DEP the, the DEP yes. person right. you know, because the, 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 to me the real crux of the thing was that they are making decisions that a given project is unpermittable without ever having, without explaining their reasoning or without, and they believe that there was no, no reason for them to interact with the applicant, um, that, they, that they have nothing to gain, that there's no more knowledge that they could get. But meanwhile, we're all trying to guess what the problem was and guess how it could be fixed. Uh, and, uh. and um, you know that the, that there was is, this, like that is that what staff. they said really on the last one on the on the new our new proposal that they just kind of said no without any explanation right right okay and, and, right. and, and the gentleman was defending that yes because we have to do it to that way yeah and, I, I heard him i heard him and, he, and, and i was just like that's they were the, very the, professional the, but it was out of their hands that was kind of what right. i kept hearing 
Right. To, to me, that was nuts. That that was just yeah. like, how can so, you, it's so, obviously not the best way to go. Right. And we don't want to put our staff in, in a, you know, awkward position, but we just, we're going to work on this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I know, Janet and Kimberly, we, we have almost the same problem with dealing with invasive species. And Janet's been trying to get many of the people along our river corridor to deal with their invasive species. And the permitting expenses are exorbitant. And we have been fortunate so far to get the state to allow us to use an RDA mm -hmm. instead of an NOI. But mm -hmm. if we require people to use an NOI, then we require them to put a lien on their house. And yeah. You know, it, it, it. Well, that's the one we withdrew, you know, and but other, I mean, that's a related, but we were successful in two private case, two yeah. of those homeowners went ahead. We went ahead individually with RDAs, and hopefully we can do some more. But these are projects where every person along the river needs to deal with it, as well as all the people upstream. And the biggest problem is that these invasive species are being filtered down into Conway, mostly from state forests. And, and yet the state is not dealing with it. So they're well, doing a little bit down near the Conway yes. Dam, but that's actually- Yes, bad well, I, yes. And, well, uh, I think, you know, if you wanted to come up with like a little soundbite to talk to the um, state legislators about the MVP program, they are very proud of the fact that almost all you know, the municipalities in Massachusetts have um, become MVP designated communities or are in the, pro you know, planning process to do so. And they've given out, I don't know, upwards of $70 million, I think. But we're going to continue to see like these big holes in Western Massachusetts for lack of funding on these landscape scale types of projects, which is exactly what we need. We don't need little band-aids here and there. We need these big kind of forward thinking projects. So the program needs to catch up with itself in terms of the, um, you know, or the state regulations need to catch up with this very high profile program. And until that happens, Yes, because um, then, because basically, and we're, cause we're spending a lot of money on this extra time on mm -hmm. this for their revisions that, okay, right. I, we got it. And I'm sorry to take so much uh, time on this, but it, it, it sounds like well, we're sort of on the same page. Yeah, it's very important. And actually, um, uh, I had had a conversation earlier today with Veronique about this, and we're going to, we've scheduled a meeting to talk to the um, Rosalie and Nick and John to kind of brainstorm about this to see if there's some ways that we can um, get some funding to revisit the Oxbow Reconnection project and think about, well, what are ways that we can still achieve the same goals but maybe reconfigure the project so it can, um, you know, be permitted and certainly the riparian buffer component and the bank stabilization component on Shelburne Falls Road, those are pretty straightforward. So, um, yeah, we're not going to... Things aren't going to change too quickly, but I hate to see you go back to the drawing board. I mean, the best one was there first to put a floodplain in. Um, right. You know, I think we need to be careful about tinkering it down Oh, we will be. Yeah, no, I, people. yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, this was what I um, said all along about the South River Meadow project. Like if we had to tinker it down to the point where it wasn't going to function, right. It, there was no use in doing it. Right. Right. Okay. But yeah. we'll have to, I mean, I don't, you know, have to study the bureaucratic organization of DEP, right. And to figure <laughs> out, you know, oh, I can give you what, some. I can give you some names, Janet. Who and what level? Because yeah. that's, I think, what we need to put into our proposal. Not just, as I said before, not just go to, go to, uh, go to our reps and say, "Oh, there's a problem. This is a terrible problem for us." You know, right? It's like, what's feasible? Okay, thank right. you. Right, and you. you know, we've got all this this money coming down too, potentially with the um, build back better. Uh, Anyway, so yeah. Um, yes. 
yeah, but um, there's there may be many other claimants for that money too, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I mean, J Janet, do you have anything else on that? Uh, well, I did just a little bit of a, a side. I had this other a grant proposal is all excited about, uh, yeah. but it, but uh, the deadlines and the bureaucracy and the combine just kind of did me in and, and all the little details, but we did in the process of it, we prepared, um, I got some estimates, the costs that maybe I could just take them in and share with you for the, the sort of the priority or the best project for this. Uh, well, could be part of a floodplain. And that was under or just north of our north stream of the covered bridge area. There's the section of 6.2 acres that the town owns. And um, of course, as time goes by, it's more filled with nothing but invasives. And total, so I got cost estimates for the professionals to to get rid of them. And the first year, year one is $6,000. Year two is 3,200. And the third year is $800. That's a lot so, less than I would have thought. Less than you would have thought? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, maybe something like this will come up again. I mean, it is the kind of project that we could get permitted. Um, with, without probably without Burkog having to to do it or incorporate it into into um, you know one of the bigger proposals, but it certainly would be nice to get it grant funded. Uh, we'd also developed a, a list of a bunch of you know plants to put in there uh, to replace the the uh, nasty ones, um, and you know we do have our community preservation act that we can go to you know which we may have to but i just wanted to to let you know uh yeah i actually love the the, the whole idea jen and i think it's great i think we really need to do something right there and um it's anybody coming from ashfield that's what you see and it, it obscures the view of the of the covered bridge and um, it's amazing how many people drive past that and don't even know it's there, which is just not awesome. even know it's there because they can't it's see awesome. it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. So that so, one. So, so that's, you know, that's a big project now. Um, probably yes. you know uh, what the Bigelow property is. It's this sort of small, right. The select board all it's next to the cemetery near the center of town. And it's, it was given to the town it's conservation land. Um, and it too has a lot of uh, invasives. It was one of the prime spots that the new pollinator project that that FERCOD did for us. They did a planned uh, design with a walking trail through the center and some shrubbery, and then we'd have more pollinators and people could use it better. And the cost for cleaning that up is uh, 2000 the first year, 1600 and then 800. So not huge, but still, you know, that work really needs to be done before we start doing mowing trails and putting in benches or whatever, whatever we're gonna recommend. Uh, so there you have a little bit of additional information. Right. And, you know, maybe, maybe some of these projects could go for the, uh, uh, the uh, new federal funding is there? Should we line up for that money, Phil? That's um, a little back better, or you don't mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, the the, the ARPA stuff, um, we're still, uh, you know, I, I it's got you got to fit you got to fit the square peg in the round hole somehow with all, with every little category. So, um, yeah, it's it. So it's, that so that wouldn't fit in an ARPA category. I mean, it potentially could. That's you know you. You okay? It's it's it's, it's 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 an open question still. Just how broadly interpretive you can make those categories and what okay. exactly? Um, you know, I I I tend to interpret things broadly, uh -huh. but I am I I am not always 
uh, persuasive and getting others to do that. So. Okay. So do, do you have right. anything, well, well, thank anything you. else about? Okay, great. So I, I, do, I do have a question about the scope of work. Um, and if I could, Veronica, maybe you can refresh my rec recollection because last week when I was going, when we were going over this, um, I talked about, well, first of all, I should just say, I just spent two hours in a contract negotiating thing. My brain is mush and I was, my basic faith in the goodness of humanity was challenged extensively. And so I, if I talk long enough, I, I will offend people. But so I, um, I'll try to make this brief, but the, uh, the, the, um, there was a clause in there about uh, pay uh, about I guess the community meetings, and I just uh, and I just remember thinking that it seemed like a high dollar figure for just a couple of meetings, and I remember like doing the math, and I was like, that's like five hundred bucks an hour, and so, I, um, I what was it like? I don't remember. Was it like forty five hundred dollars for two meetings or something like that? Do you mean the committee <laughs> meetings, Conway committees? No, 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 no. Like in the scope of work for the contract, the, the, the public, whatever, the community meetings, not committee meetings. Um, mm. And, and I, I just thought that that was like, um, I don't know, maybe the easiest part of performing that contract and just like it just seemed lucrative. I don't know. Like what There's, So uh, and I'll let Rosalie, you know, Rosalie can respond as well, because part of that um, money uh, uh, where the COG and the consultant team are, are sharing that money. But there is quite a bit of time that goes into uh, putting together the PowerPoint present, you know, the slides for the meeting, doing the outreach and um, coordinating with the town. And then also just this uh, staff time involved for actually attending the meetings and then doing the follow-up. So there's kind of a lot of behind the scenes work that happens um, before like a one hour or one and a half hour um, community, you know, outreach event. Also MVP is very, per the grant program is very particular about um, the type of documentation that we need to provide as part of the deliverables in terms of the efforts that we've undertaken to engage people, um, you know, to attend the meeting. And so Conway, we have a good track record um, because of the help of the Friends of the South River and other folks that have been working on this for many, many years. Um, you know, they help uh, with the outreach as well, but we provide the materials that are um, handed out, which take, you know, time to put together what, whether it's, you know, done in, um, in design or PowerPoint. So um, we spent some money on community outreach with the forestry project with Mary Wigmore and the meetings that she led. And I know I think those paid for themselves easily, you, you know, right. in the, and in the I trust actually that everyone at, had in the project. The, and I actually looked at those and that was $2,000. And and she did a ton of meetings and they lasted forever. And she's like, saw, she healed the community divides. <laughs> and like, um, and there was like 30 and 40 people and some of, the, and with diametrically opposite opinions on everything. And, um, you know, but that's not this. This is like twice that for less than that. And um, yeah, I like, I, and, and I was like, you know, how do you, how, how is that number calculated? Is it based on an hourly, whatever estimate of people and like, what were, what were the hourly fees and wait, whatever. That's just. I, I right. Know. Well, yeah. I mean, the, like, the cog, the cogs billing rate is generally um, we use an average of $75 an hour because a variety of staff, you know, work on a project. So our average billing rate is $75 an hour. Because, you know, I, I, I don't know. Could you pay people, like, if they come in the door, could we give, like, because you could ask for $4,000 and then offer $10 for everybody that walks in the door. You'd have a huge audience. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> uh, but... Just yeah. supply food. Yeah, you, yeah, that's you exactly. had pizza at the first meeting, and I got a lot of people there. 
right? There you go. <laughs> there you go. No, um, that was, that's the stuff that always trips me up. I don't know. <laughs> the the only stuff it. I could, the only stuff I can really understand, I guess. I don't know. We do in, include, you know, in, on GZA's end in the public outreach task, we're also including um, the outreach to individual landowners. Um, and, you know, that level of effort can be sometimes un, you know, unpredictable. Um, you don't say. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, our billing rate is a, a little bit higher than what Kimberly mentions, probably at a minimum $100 an hour. See, that Phil Furcog is cheap. <laughs> <laughs> generally speaking I'm i think sorry. the well, just remember folks it's a it's a lot cheaper than having a full-time staff professional staff mm -hmm. or even a half-time professional staff yep yep who'd have to consult the engineers and some other expertise anyway Yep. Um, all right. So, uh, what's what's the timeline, Kimberly, for you to have all this signed, sealed, and delivered? And hopefully, like tonight, um, because we can't start working on this until we have the executed contracts, and so we've got you know. Um, the town has contractual deadlines with the MVP grant program. And so we want to make sure that the town, you know, that work is completed in a timely fashion. So if the board voted to sign the contracts tonight, we can turn them around fairly quickly and then get going on the work. It's a good nudge right there. Yes. Okay. Um, so anybody see a reason not to sign? Uh, not, no, no, no. We're always grateful, always grateful for all the kind assistance. <laughs> so I would make a motion that we sign these contracts. And yes. I don't know exactly what the formal word is for the contract. Uh, it would be the MVP 2021-22 cycle, whatever. There is one contract with GCA and one contract with the FERCOG. All right. So, yeah, for the MVP project. So there you go. So we would, I would make a motion that we sign both of them. I didn't hear that, but I saw your mouth moving there, Erica. But <laughs> You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> second. I second that motion. Great. All right. Okay. I, I vote aye. All in favor, aye. aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. We are contractually indebted to you once again. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, too. Oh, thank and you. It was all, It's always nice to see you all. Rosalie, I wanted to ask one more question, even though we voted. But I, I think you were doing some surveying of the property that we've now, I believe, purchased over at 69 Main Street. Uh, but you weren't allowed on the property at the time. And did you get the data that you needed or, you know, are you allowed was, to go on it now? Um, if, if, yeah, I wasn't aware that it's been purchased. If we're allowed. It, it hasn't been purchased. Then, by, uh, uh, it, well, there, it, it's, it's not purchased until it's purchased. Um, so, but it is, uh, we are now, we are now presumably able to go onto the property though. Yeah. Yeah. That's what, yeah. Yeah, then, you know, that was part of the detailed information that we didn't get for the first model. We had to use some assumed assumed information. So um, if we can go on to that property and, and actually go into the river and get some uh, bathymetry data, that would um, improve the model that we had developed. Bill, yeah. do you think that we actually have that permission or should we request it? Um or maybe Veronique would know. I'm not sure. I mean, we can, I, I can double check, but I would say go ahead and do it. And if there's a problem, we'll let you know. Um, and where exactly 
is that development then of those that specific plan is is that coming out of this Kimberly is that coming out of this contract or the last one or where is that yeah so what um Rosalie is talking about or what we're talking about here is the um, hydraulic and hydrologic modeling for Conway Center and Pumpkin Hollow Brook. And does that include the new purchase land? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the hydraulic modeling and then is the actual design, the engineer specs, is that another step, a subsequent one? I'll let Rosalie answer that. Um, I think you might be referring to one of the potential options that we had considered for that property. Um, right. And Cutting through the berm. Yeah, we didn't, we, so in the prior uh, grant, we didn't pursue that. We didn't pursue a final design for that because um, we weren't sure if we'd be able to implement it. Right. Um, but, you know, I think that our scope of work with the um, additional modeling will include, you know, the development of a, of a variety of options, which, so that could be one of the options we consider there. Right. Okay. There, I think that we start out with like a, a list of 10, Rosalie, and then whittle it down to five. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we put in specific numbers. Yeah, but the other thing to consider in that area, Janet, is, and it's really important, is what's going on with Pumpkin Hollow Brook and the amount of water that's coming down into the South River at that point. So it might be that once the, the model is updated with, the, you know, kind of on the ground data and run through a couple of different scenarios that the original project that was conceived like back in the, you know, 2013 or whenever it was 20 after Irene to reconnect the river to the floodplain there might also be, it might be coupled with work along Pumpkin Hollow Brook or in the upland portion of the watershed. We'll just have to see what the model shows us but we'll be, you know, doing kind of a similar process where we're talking to the town and stakeholders as this information is developed and getting, you know, feedback from you. The only reason I raise this issue is that it's getting to be winter soon. And, mm -hmm. and if this is data that you need, and it would probably be easier to get it before we have a foot of snow on the ground. And we could have a foot of snow on the ground now, but it hasn't snowed mm -hmm. yet. And I'm glad of that, but uh, it, it's going to be pretty yeah, cold this week. We, um, that's definitely a consideration and made it very challenging for us in the last round <laughs> <laughs> with survey and, and winter weather. Yeah, yeah. Great. Um, so we voted to already sign it. What else? What else do you need from us? What else do you want from us? <laughs> well, just to just to be so, Rosalie, are are you all set? Then it sounds like um, once the contracts are signed, if you did um, want to schedule any field work, um, you would just coordinate with Veronique on on this. Um, sure. Okay. Okay. Sure. Right. Because I, the cog is playing a bit of a different role in this grant. We're not kind of like the overseer. It, right. You're working directly, like with the town. Right. Well, you're, you're still the overseer in our hearts. Oh, thanks. <laughs> well, and we'll we'll be coordinating with the the outreach and that yeah that aspect. Yeah. Great. Good, 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 good. Thank, thank you all. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Happy Thanksgiving. Hey, happy oh, Thanksgiving to you. Yeah. Thanks.
Um, J Janet, did you have anything else about your mass wildlife climate change grant no. that didn't come through and that didn't quite happen, but was right. a great idea, but was a great idea. Right, I did make a special appeal to the guy. The, yeah. And uh, it didn't work. It, it looked like there were only two applications. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we'll keep our eyes out and come after for our ARPA money, however we do that. How do you do that, by the way, Bill? Well, um, the actual like mechanics of who, which official you like write the letter to, I don't have those instructions in front of me, but there, there are a series of categories uh -huh. and you're, you're, they, they have already announced the amount that the town will get, um, but, and they've announced the, the amount that the state will get, but the state hasn't yet figured out how they're going to, what they're doing. So there is, a, there is a belief that the state will, be spending it on behalf of towns in some manner. Um, but we're not sure how that's going to work out yet because they're all took a seven week vacation instead of answering that question. Oh, okay. Uh, well, well, we'll uh, keep this in mind. And, but you know, we do have a, a committee that has formed already the ARPA advisory committee um, with several interested citizens. Nelson Shipley is one of them. And, um, um, J, uh, Jim uh, Lar Lombar Lombardio, La Liam, whatever, I forget his, his granddaughter's Angela. Sorry, that's all I know. Um, um, uh, uh, and, um, um, you know, we still have time yet. The money doesn't have to be spent until 2024. Okay. So it's intended to be sort of a multi-year thing. And there will be some school expenditures related to it, but one of the categories is stormwater management and, um, you know, whatever. So it's envisioned that these issues will feature in that in some way. But one of the right. other things that you can do, you know, it's all it's also to make up for those that have been economically injured. And my, you know, one of the things that I believe is possible is just to send checks to everybody. Um, declare them economically disadvantaged by the by the pandemic and send money out. So, to me, that's always going to be well, a pretty may, maybe one. somebody will bring up elderly housing again. See, now we talked about that. It's interesting that you meant. And you know, there's there's the beginnings, the beginnings of a percolation of momentum in that regard. Um, but if you'd like to be part of that, I will make sure that you are no. called it. Okay. <laughs> no, I just want to, you know, I want to, I can present, I can present. Yes, 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 yes. there is, there is, I'm trying, trying to resuscitate that one, for real. And, oh, but, um, well, well, you know, you know, we had a separate housing committee. Yes, so, yes. You, you remember, okay, and they yeah, did, and Nelson worked on it, and okay, yes, so. Yes, it's really there good. Been a, there have been a lot team. of other ideas to just buy acquire some housing, say in Pumpkin Hollow or some smaller housing, because there's no place the town can build, can build a, a complex that well, you know, that, unless you find that. Um, well, what about at the top of South River Meadow? Like the plans originally no, called for? Absolutely not. No? What uh, uh, Nelson was there. Nelson, that's when he bailed out. He said, you know, it's going to cost a million, almost a million dollars in fill, fill, brought in right. fill to so, stabilize it. That banks to. So that's you know, one challenge that, you know, we'll, well see. No, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not, no, we're not supporting that. It's, Ooh. It's, it's, it's Ooh. Boy, you, you didn't take long. Fill. Phil, I don't know where you were. That, that debate has already been had. And, and the committee including Nelson, who is a sensible builder, uh, withdrew it, basically. I mean, it, it just was right, right. The town right. could acquire some other land. Uh, but anyway, for a while, the planning board wanted to take over housing. 
Um, the last town administrator thought that just for the sake of tidying th things up, because the, nobody had been, the committee had non-functioned for a number of years, yes. thought as a separate committee, thought we should remove it. Um, and I think there's hope that the planning board could 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 do this job. Uh, so I don't know where it st stands, but it's a big big task. Yes. Yes. Maybe well, just to take over chair. We haven't given up, just to let you know. And it's actually, we've been talking about it. So good. Okay. And, and Nelson's involved in that discussion. Good. good. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Thank you, Janet. Janet. All right. Items not anticipated 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Here's where I'm going to use the chair's prerogative to move up from the mail, the National Grid Herbicide Application Notice, which I have not even read. Um, however, I assume, Ronnie, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, it's some letter saying they plan to spray herbicides along power lines X, Y, and Z in your town. And um, as I don't know, Erica, if you were on the select board when this came up the last time with Eversource in town. Oh. It was a super popular issue all of a sudden. I mean, the number of, Bob, you remember, we got a lot of letters and emails about this. Yeah. And none of them, none of them were in favor of like lots of spray. And we were assured in writing and um, in separate letters that Everything would be done by the book, da, 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 the, only the list of contractors, blah, 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 using the list of approved item, you know, the, and everything would be inspected and double checked and on the up and up. And then, um, was it a, two years ago, whatever, a year ago, we got that opinion from the administrative law judge in the mail about Eversource's conduct underneath the high transmission lines above Bardwell's Ferry that big, big project. And what we saw was it was a consent order that because that particular land that they um, poisoned and endangered species that they wiped out was actual state owned land. But we received a copy of it because it was in Conway. And it was a consent order of Eversource with the DEP acknowledging all the incredibly that, you know, they actually wiped out a location a known location of this very rare native bittersweet not that like the bittersweet that everybody hates but like an actual endangered species which their own and i'm just, this is my recollection of what that opinion says and i was trying to find it i couldn't find it bob on on my email thing i don't know if you can but the reason, the reason i'm going into this because i remember talking about it with you that it was like amazing that 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 they, they got caught, first of all, the, this thing that the, the endangered location of Bittersweet, they flagged it themselves. A pro and then, um, be, but because it was right where they wanted to build their landing for their heavy equipment, they just went ahead and, and, and killed it all and um, hoped the state wouldn't notice. And but the this state, was on state owned property? It was on state owned property. And, and so they destroyed, I think it was six plus acres of this rare bittersweet. And they had, and um, they, you know, they got, they, they had to promise not to do it ever again, to, uh, to give their con subcontractors better training. And then they had to agree to replant um, a bit, some bittersweet if they could find it within 20 years or something in some other place. <laughs> and, and it was just like the ultimate slap in the wrist, like um, non penalty. And, you know, um, my thing is that we need to publicize that and, and that we should be calling the recorder reporter say, here's this administrative law opinion. And uh, the town of Conway does not support these herbicide applications because we can't trust these companies. And here's why. And just see what happens. And so that's like, I, you know, we don't, our, our objections mean nothing, but getting it in the newspaper and having lots of people object might mean something. And, and that, and I remember talking about this opinion at, at the meeting and, 
at several select board meetings because I was just shocked by it. And they sent it to us. And it's, I know it's on my email. It's got to be on your email too, Bob. And it was, they, it was an administrative law opinion, so like 30, 40 pages. Mm. And it was just all the many ways that Eversource just does not say, do what they said and swore up and down what they were going to do. They just, it's just not in their system to even be able to do what they say they do. It's like, it's, they get, they're getting away with like saying they're going to be doing it by the book. They don't do it by the book and they get away with it. So. Well, I read the letter for the national grid one that we're looking at today. All right. All and right. that it talks about it being a combined mechanical. Right. Plus herbicide. Yeah. What that means is that if they can't kill all the endangered species with just the herbicide, they'll get out a front end loader and dig it all up. So that's what that means. Um, if I may, the, the letter also does ask the town to um, verify the sensitive areas on the maps that they provide. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Here's, and, yeah, great. Great. So, I mean, I don't know if, if you want to try looking for that thing, I know it was like a, I thought it was like a September two years ago, but I don't know what I did with it. I couldn't find it. Um, mm, uh, look, I, I don't, it right. sounds like quite a hunt. Yeah. But so if I can find that, then my proposal would be that we publicize it. We know it's ever source, not national grid, but, and then we, Sign, we signed some letter saying uh, to, to National Grid saying we object to you spraying within Conway Town limits, period. And, and, and in that, we are manifesting the 100% will of the people as expressed to us. So, and there was like a dozen easy, like people that were really passionate about this that felt the need to communicate with us. More, I think. So, I don't know. What do you think about that? Uh, do you think we would get anywhere by saying you can't, you know, no herbicides in Conway? I, I, no, I don't think we even have the legal right to, like, object. You know, right. we, can, we can say we object. It doesn't mean we can, like, you know, force. I mean, I, mean, I you know, we, we can ask Kenny to, like, use his truck and block them from entering town limits. But <laughs> I don't think he can do that. But, um, you know. I was but, pleased when I read this letter at the extent to which they talk about mechanical means. Right. And that's what Eversource's letters always did. That's the yeah. whole thing. That's the whole thing. Like they have, they, their public relations part is really good. And then they turn it over into to subcontractors who they don't really train. And they say, here's the rules that you're supposed to follow, but there's not really anybody checking up on them. Um, you know, you know, and, and the subcontractors hire people at the lowest, you know, at minimum wage. It's like, you know, high school kid in a truck mixing up the pesticides. Yeah, this is. Um, I don't know. I, and I, you know, I should I should find that opinion. I should circulate it to you, too, as well, because it really was just like I cannot believe that they actually did this in Conway and got away with it. And kind of thought at the time that we should publicize it, except it was all over and done with. And I was like waiting for the next utility pesticide application per request. And here it is. So, so what do you think? You're not, you you don't seem too enthusiastic about publicizing it. It's okay. No. We don't have to. Uh, Veronique, did you verify where they're going to be cutting as opposed to doing herbicide? Uh, I mean, when I read this letter, you know, they list the potential treatment periods and they specify when they're all going to be, and they all appear to be mechanical. Yeah, no, I have not verified them, but I'm happy to. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've been having trouble with my microphone tonight, so I wasn't sure. <clears throat> all right. So... 
So you don't want to send you don't want to send a letter because you think it's all mechanical. You don't want to send a letter saying we object to you doing any pesticide spraying. Well, I think we could sure say we support the mechanical, and but but I don't you know we could say we object. I have no problem with that, but right. I don't all think right. it'll slow them down. But all yeah. Right. All right. Well, then can um can we can we have a motion just so that we'll within the next few days we'll just compose a little letter saying that we object and that we support your mechanical processes, but uh, not yeah. herbicide and or pesticide. All right. I'll interpret that as a motion and second it. All right, all in favor? Aye. Okay, thanks. And then- Did Erica vote? Yeah, aye. Yeah. Yes, it was unanimous. So uh, town administrator update. Um, okay, so uh, just to let you know, we now we used to do our internal shredding in just a regular, you know, shredding machine. And um, Lori did some research and found Pro Shred. Um, I then did a competitive price between three different companies. Anyway, long story short, we have a console in the town hall and also one in the town office. Um, that will be picked up every eight weeks for Happy all Veterans Day, Day, America. For all the veterans. Sorry. <laughs> Happy uh, Veterans Day. Yes. Yes. Um, so um, anyway, so that we've got the shredding going, and um, which is kind of nice for me because the MRF was no longer taking shredded paper, so all of our shredded paper was going to the trash. So now it'll be recycled. Um, as Phil mentioned, the, we have the ARPA working group um, and then also the Community and Economic Development Committee having their first meetings. We also had the Town Hall Renovation Committee, which had actually been formed, I think, pre-COVID, but had not had a first meeting. So we've now had our first meeting and we're kind of reviewing plans that had happened. Um, boy, some of them from 10 years ago and just trying to get back up to speed on what's happened with um, any kind of planning for, for uh, renovating the town hall. Transfer station, we have a new heater for the um, transfer station attendance shed that's all legal up to code installed. Um, we're gonna be working on getting rid of the wood as you're exiting the transfer station. Um, you just okay. passed the mall on the left-hand side, there's a big pile of wood that's there that I believe was left over from when there used to be a wood stove in the attendance shed. Now that we're propane, we don't need it. And if we can get rid of that wood, then we can have people parking there um, as overflow for the mall rather than blocking everybody as they're trying to get to the different um, materials. So that, um, you know, I spoke with Ron and he said, you know, people can take it. I do want to point out that um, nobody should be thinking they could bring up a chainsaw to make it any smaller because we can't allow that. <laughs> but um, if people can fit it in their trucks, they're they're welcome to take what's there. Bernie, is the wood small enough to go into a pickup? I believe some of it is. I mean, I guess it depends on on how many people you have helping you pick it up. Yeah, so, I mean, it, yeah. if you put a sign there and said free, people are driving by there in the, with their pickup trucks. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're hoping we'll get rid of it that way. Yeah. Um, for sure. I, I think you could probably fit at least two, if not three, parking spots there, depending on how well people park, which should help the overflow traffic from um, from the mall. And I did want to point out to everybody that Christmas falls on a Saturday this year, so that's an open day. Uh, and so, um, and of course, nobody should have to work on Christmas. So we will be open on Friday, the day before, and Sunday, the day after. Um, for the transfer station. And last but not least, I wanted to go back to the cybersecurity. Um, I have attached um, a picture in the handout for you, which just shows, this is through the webinars that we've been doing through FERCOG, and it just shows all the different departments in a municipality and how many different kinds of sensitive data there is that is handled through a municipality. And this is the kind of thing that the towns are going to have to get a handle on how many records they actually have that are potentially vulnerable um, and put that in a um, a incident response plan 
So I just wanted to let you all know about that. And, and doing that kind of response plan could take a while, just to give you a heads up. Just, just to interrupt briefly, is the, is the incident response plan something that an emergency management director has to do? No, <laughs> you have your own. <laughs> good. Good. Okay. Now, this would be something actually that would be. Okay, good. No, no, I'm, I'm better. I'm, I'm good. It's okay. Good. It would be led by probably Roy and myself, and, and what it would be would be talking with all the department heads and reviewing the information that they have that if, heaven forbid, um, we had a hacker could be vulnerable and how, you know, how to protect it. We do, I just want to point out that we do have insurance, cybersecurity insurance through Maya, and I will be reviewing that because I was not involved in setting it up, but I'll be reviewing that sort of line by line so I have a better idea because we're being told by through these webinars that coming down the pike, they think that having an incident response plan may become necessary to get cyber security insurance. So this is something I definitely want to begin working on. Just plus, it's just a good idea to have on hand so that, and they keep saying it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when something happens. So I just think it's good to be prepared. And, bless you. and that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thanks. Select board member comments or concerns. Oh, did you have any questions, Bob? Was you going to say something? No, no. All right. Any comments or concerns? Um, other other mail. Yes. Um, recycling dividends program grant award notice. Yeah. That came in. That was that's very good. I was really excited about that, but then I was told I shouldn't be that it's we get that. <laughs> But um, I don't know. I get excited. When, I get excited when they get when somebody gives us money. Um, <laughs> sure, it is exciting, and it helps with our with our recycling and composting program. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, uh, congratulations! That was well done, Bronnie. Thank you. Um, notice of EverSource winter rates. So I was going to talk to that. Yes, good. Well. So, I mean, this relates to what I would call our, our Conway aggregation. Conway is a member of a 13 town aggregation. We aggregated our electricity about a year and a half ago. And we're now almost to the end of the first year of our second contract. We had a contract for the first five months of the pandemic when the price of electricity was very low. And then we had we went out for bid for that contract separately so we could get a very low price at least for that five months and then we went out for a three-year contract for we went out for various years but we thought the three-year contract was especially good and we got fairly low prices that will last then for three years starting almost a year ago and so conway has is now at just about the end of the first year of that three-year contract and so our price is going to be steady for those three years. And Eversource is required to come out, to, to go out for bid every six months. And so every six months they come out with either their new winter prices, which they've just come out with, and then they'll come out with their summer prices next spring. And they usually the winter prices are a little higher than the summer prices. And, but for their winter price, so, so I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you um, four numbers. Now, the reason it's four numbers, one is for Eversource. The other three numbers are for the three programs that we offer here in Conway. And so people in Conway can choose either the lowest price one, which is just the state's minimum amount of renewable energy, or Conway's 25% project, which is state minimum plus 25% more renewable energy than the state minimum. And then Conway also offers 100% class one renewable energy. That's our most expensive form of electricity. And so I'm gonna, I can tell you three interesting numbers, but to me, the most interesting thing is we are offering 100% renewable energy, class one renewable energy at a price that's lower than Comcast's new winter rates. So I always wonder when Comcast is going to announce their winter rates, how they will fall compared with our Conway numbers. 
So every, you mean ever and, and I just think yeah. this is so wonderful. Uh, you, you know, and, and it always mystifies me that people in Conway are sticking with buying their electricity from Eversource. And um, there were some people I know originally who said they didn't like the fact that they were being opted in. And so they choose not to be in the program because they just didn't like the fact that they were being put into the program and it wasn't that they voluntarily went into the program. And so they choose, chose not to be in the program. And all I can say is here we are a year later, a year and a half after the beginning of the program, they could voluntarily now choose to be in the program and they will save them some money. And, and, and so, and, and as time has gone on, the amount of money that they will be saving continues to go up. So Eversource announced their new winter rates at, um, so the electricity cost is 13.7 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, Eversource also charges another 12 or so cents on top of that, and they call that their distribution charge. So their electricity rate will be about 25 cents. And whether you buy your electricity from Conway or from Eversource, you will pay that additional 12 cent distribution charge. So we're really just talking about the actual cost of the electricity that's being delivered to you, not the elect that cost plus the 12 cent distribution charge. So Eversource's new rate is 13.7 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. Conway's rate that we've had for a year and we will have for another two years, we charge about 9.3 cents per kilowatt hour compared to 13.7. So we charge more than four cents left per kilowatt hour, less per kilowatt hour. Um, our rate for, for the state minimum plus 25% renewable, which is the most common one that people purchase, is about 10.3 cents per kilowatt hour. And our 100% renewable energy is uh, 13.1 cents, which is still over half a cent less than whatever source is charging for their basic, you know, no more green than the state minimum requirement. So, so to me, this is all good. Our electricity rates, if you're in the program, is from almost a nickel less per kilowatt hour to just a little bit less if you're in the 100% green. And you can choose whichever of those programs you want to be in. And you can opt in or opt out whenever you want. And I'm saying all this because I'm hoping that some people might listen to this and, and choose to join the program who aren't currently in the program. And now and then our, our aggregation uh, company that, that, that you know, purchase, purchases the electricity for us, they send out notices to everybody in Conway that's not currently in the program just to say, you know, you might want to consider joining the program again. So anybody who's not in the program just has to make a phone call and, and they could easily get into the program. The, the company that's in our aggregation company is called um, Colonial, uh, uh, Colonial Power System, I think it is. And, uh, and, and so they would, you would go to uh, Colonial, oh, I should know this, but... I send it to you guys, colonialpowersystem.com slash uh, uh, Conway. And if you go to our Conway webpage, you'll find it in there. So you just, you can go to their, their, that web address and fill out a form. You can call a telephone number that's in there, or you could, uh, uh, well, you could call the uh, actual company that we buy our electricity from Dynagy, but that's probably a little more complicated. But if you call Co Colonial directly, that's the best way to to join the program. So that's what that's about. Okay. Not controversial as far as I can see. It's all all good. Mm -hmm. Okay. The only uh, other thing for anybody who's listening to this, and this is 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 if you really if you object to this program somehow, if you really have problems with it, please let me know. Um, in another two years, we're going to be going out for electricity again. And so if you don't like the various forms of renewable energy that we've chosen to offer to the people of Conway, um, or if you have any complaints about it at all, I would love to talk to you, to, you know, find out how can we make the program better. 
have the vendor next time be required to post their profit and loss statement. <laughs> Seriously. I remember you bringing that up. Seriously. That's what bugs me about it. They're performing in a highly, re- they figured out the loophole about how to be in a highly regulated governmental, governmentally regulated space without having to disclose. They compete with a great many other companies right. who do the same job. As far as I can tell, there's two good ones. We have, we're in one good one and the other one is called Good Energy that, that John O'Rourke works for. And the, John O'Rourke, their company, Good Energy, does mostly eastern Massachusetts, and Colonial Power does, uh, you know, small small towns and especially all across the state, but includes western Massachusetts. And they are by far the the uh, the, the two that that I don't know seem to be the best as far as we can tell. Well, let's hope so. Even if they're not disclosing their profit and loss and they're giving you their tax forms. Yep. Yep. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't always get, I, yeah, I don't get in my way ever. So. <laughs> um, announcements, any announcements? Uh, Thursday is Thanksgiving. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Yes. Um, our next meeting, December 6, 2021, at 6 p.m. by Zoom. Um, and then we'll have one more meeting in December. Normally, the first meeting in January is where we begin our every week. But I think we might make that like the third meeting in January or the second, whatever. We might not do that till the end of January because we delay we by pushing town meeting back to the first weekend in June. We now have a little bit more space in that schedule. So to try to work it out so that we don't have to we don't have to do every week until we have to do every week so, yeah great um yeah but until we meet again december 6th and um um motion to adjourn a so second moved. so moved and uh, yeah unanimous Aye. And very good everybody thank you thank, thank you phil nice to see you yes. erica bye yep.